So without further ado, up next on the stage, we'll be talking to Torsten Herbert, who's Director for Market Development and Public Affairs at Nell Hydrogen, one of our favorite customers. Nell Hydrogen, game changer across application and markets. Stay tuned, uh, we'll be back in a minute. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon here at the Hannover Fair 2023. We're going to talk about hydrogen and fuel cells, and that's what we do with our next guest. In case you haven't already, grab a seat, have a drink, and enjoy the interview. In case any questions arise and you want to participate in our dialogue, just raise your hand, and I will come to you with the microphone. So I'm happy to introduce our next guest, we're going to talk about Nell Hydrogen, game changer across application and markets. And my guest will be Thorsten Herbert. He is Director for Market Development and Public Affairs. So please give him a warm welcome. Hello. Hey. So great to have you here for the, the second so time far today. For me now. Yeah. Very good. You've already been here this morning in yeah, the discussion. True. Um, but I'm sure you've got much more to tell us. Uh, so now we're going to talk about Nell. And yeah, with more than 3,500 electrolyzers installed around the globe, you're definitely a major player in the market. Maybe you can take the audience and me on a little journey of the history of Nell because you already started quite early in 1927. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what's your story and where are you at today? Yeah, so we're actually quite proud of this uh, yeah, long-lasting history. Uh, as you said, uh, the first large-scale alkaline electrolyzer, um, kind of the basis of the technology, the alkaline technology today, um, was already operational in 1927 indeed, um, uh, with more than 100 megawatt at that point. So this is still, I guess, uh, one of the largest electrolyzer installations, uh, at least in Europe. That's quite impressive. Uh, since, yeah. since then, so that's still kind of the record in Europe um, as we speak. Um, yeah, and that was, um, in fact, the, the, the vision at that time that Norway, uh, with green hydrogen production, um, and ammonia uh, production, so it was actually about fertilizers for um, the um, um, yeah, agricultural okay. um, yeah. applications, um, actually feeding the world with fertilizers from Norway, that uh, was the vision at that time. Yeah, and then uh, natural gas became too cheap. Uh, and actually the electrolyzer slash green hydrogen technology um, kind of took a downward turn. Um, that was all part, kind of our heritage is part of uh, Norsk Kudro, um, which uh, like is a big industrial player uh, in, in, in Norway, but also internationally. So Nell was originally the electrolyzer department of Norsk Kudro. Um, then, yeah, further ups and downs, and then there was like kind of the restart of the well, of the Nell as we know it today, uh, with uh, the listing at the stock exchange um, around 2011, 2012, um, and then further on in 2015 and 2017, we acquired uh, two companies: uh, one for the PEM electrolyzer technology in the U.S. Uh, and the fueling technology in Denmark. Um, and that's where we are today, with around a bit more than 600 employees worldwide, um, and the three technologies, PEM electrolyzers, alkaline electrolyzers, and hydrogen fueling uh, technology. Yeah, thank you very much for that big overview. I already like to dig deeper into the technology. So, as you mentioned, you offer both PEM and alkaline electrolyzers. Mm. Perhaps you can briefly pick the audience up on the subject, like 
in, in short and simple terms, what's the difference? Where are the individual strengths of the system? And how do the applications differ? Yeah. Um, so clearly, for those of you are, that are interested in uh, the technologies and the different electrolyzer technologies, and also talking about the history, it become, kind of becomes obvious that the alkaline technology is kind of the established technology, is like an industrial asset since a century, basically. Um, so that helps us and also helped us and now finally to uh, fully automate the production uh, of uh, these electrolyzers. And that at the same time means that they are uh, very uh, cost attractive at the moment. So when it comes to CapEx, alkaline uh, is like a very good place to go. Um, especially the NEL uh, alkaline electrolyzer since they are fully automated uh, in the production and Therefore, we can also um, yeah, ramp up and uh, produce on large scale and therefore also decrease the costs. Although we still see uh, a potential of around like 40% uh, further cost reduction uh, in the alkaline technology. So cost on alkaline side is a clear, clear uh, advantage. Um, and on the PEM technology, we have uh, the basically, I think the, what I want to highlight is the dynamic uh, capabilities of PEM. So you can actually drive it dynamically, okay. uh, where the alkaline technology doesn't like that very much. So it's also, it also doesn't mean you can't run an alkaline electrolyzer um, uh, dynamically, but uh, you need to be more cautious and uh, give him some more time uh, to uh, react. Um, so dynamic response of the PEM, and that plays actually quite well with uh, also fluctuating renewables, for example. Um, and then um, footprint is also like a large difference. Okay, yeah. Um, you see some stacks around, I guess, uh, mainly PEM stacks, and that has a reason because PEM uh, has a much, much smaller footprint uh, than alkaline. So they're but easier to bring here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but nevertheless, if you have the space, for example, in an industrial application, if you have the space, uh, if you have a continuous uh, power uh, feed, um, the alkaline uh, solution is a, is a very good place to go. Um, if you have uh, place restrictions, if you are dependent on a direct coupling, and if you see uh, kind of the dynamics of the renewable plant, maybe PEM is the go-to place, but you have to bring in some more money. Okay, thank you very much. So it's great that you're offering different solutions for different applications. I'm quite sure that as the director of market development and public affairs, you always keep a keen eye on what's happening in the market. And we're not talking about only technical challenges. We're also talking about different circumstances under which we have to operate, for example, from the regulatory side. Maybe you can tell us a bit about this. How does this affect your work? And are you active in this field as a company? Uh, absolutely. So that was uh, one of our, like, or my focus areas uh, together with my colleague uh, who is located in Brussels. And I also like, highlighted it this morning that, uh, and it can, cannot be highlighted more, actually. So I'm now in hydrogen about like 20 years. Um, and I would say at least since like five to ten years, we are asking politicians, especially in Brussels, we need a regulatory framework. Uh, and now, not, um, not the less with our uh, contribution in Brussels, uh, this is about to materialize, right? So the regulatory framework we have been asking for for like quite some years now, this is going to happen soon. Um, which means, on the one hand, great, because we finally have it, but at, on the other hand, it's on us now. So there's no one else we can point fingers at now. So it's really on us, and if I say us, it's like all, all the um, exhibitors here, like the hydrogen industry. 
So it's time for scale up and the stand up uh, scenario. Ab absolutely. So we have to deliver now. We have to make it happen. Uh, and like maybe three highlights um, of like what happened in the last months. Um, it was indeed the delegated act uh, for renewable hydrogen. So definition of renewable hydrogen. So you actually know, you actually now have a proposal on, 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 on our desks. If you are a green hydrogen producer, what are the criteria to, for the hydrogen to yeah, count as renewable, right? Um, which was crucial for the project developers and, and uh, the, the hydrogen producers. So that is the one thing. Then the other thing, is, and that's very good for us as an electrolyzer manufacturer, is the demand side targets. And these have been defined in the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, with um, a binding target of 42% renewable hydrogen use in industry in 2030. Um, and this is like a really, really good success because that gives us as a manufacturer, as a technology manufacturer, kind of a base load. So we need to entertain kind of this 42% renewable hydrogen in industry. And like uh, over the thumb first estimation, that's 5 million tons already. Uh, so that's great. And the, the third part um, was the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation with a clear mandate for the member states to install a minimum uh, number of stations along the uh, trans-European uh, transport networks. Uh, so that's, that w that's been great news and uh, yeah, unfortunately gives us no one to finger point at anymore. I'm sure you will rise to the challenge. So um, now that we have this framework, we've been particularly talking about Europe, um, but you as a company, you are active all around the globe. We see different markets and different constraints in different markets. The, the US, for example, came up with the Inflation Reduction Act. Maybe we can dive a bit into that direction. Yeah, so I talked also this morning about the, the strategy process that we went through in Nell. Uh, and part of that strategy was kind of a focusing exercise. So what are our focus areas? What is our core competence? And uh, which markets do we want to concentrate on? And there we, cre we clearly said uh, this is obviously Europe. It's ob obviously North America. And then uh, we also said like the two like potentially huge import hubs to these ge geographies, which is Australia and, and Chile, um, with like very um, yeah, favorable uh, conditions for, for renewable energies. That these are the areas, like the four areas, where we also kind of proactively uh, act as NEL uh, in these markets. It doesn't mean that we don't want to sell uh, equipment into the other parts of the world. Um, but that's kind of on a project-to-project -project basis then. Uh, in these areas, we are, these are really our, we call it tier one uh, areas where we want to be proactive. And uh, with regards to like specificities of uh, these uh, areas, I think mainly focusing on Europe and the US. Um, of course, that's our home uh, uh, markets, right? So with Norway and Denmark in Europe and the location in the US, that's our home markets. I think that's obvious. And then, but we also have like a very high political ambition. We have in the US, for example, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, which indeed also within NEL uh, shifted a bit the priorities when it comes to um, also manufacturing capacity expansions. Okay. Um, so you so might that know that we have this factory, strategy. that we have this factory in Norway for alkaline uh, electrolyzers, which is continuously kind of uh, built out now. So we have 500 megawatt per year already in operation. The second line is built as we speak, uh, and the building gives room for like up to two gigawatt annual production capacity of alkaline per year. Um, and in the US, um, we have uh, just announced and also took financial decision uh, to um, increase the capacity of our existing facility from 50 to 500 megawatt on the PEM side. 
And then probably soon uh, you can kind of keep your ears open and eyes open. There will be an announcement for like a larger um, location in the US. Um, yeah, we're talking about a Giga factory okay. uh, in, in the US. And here, indeed, the Inflation Reduction Act that you mentioned uh, took, his, took a bit of a turn yeah. in, in the priority. Okay. Uh, so we definitely uh, focused a bit on like, finding a location uh, in, in the US to kind of also utilize the dynamic. And uh, maybe it's not like a coincidence that the largest orders that we received lately were like, both from the US with around like 200 megawatt uh, plants. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's uh, big plans. You know, where we so, are. Yeah, big milestones ahead. That sounds yeah. super interesting. Yeah. I want to give the chance to the audience in case you have any question, questions right now. Oh yeah, there's a question in the front row. Mm. Stay seated. Yeah, I actually had a question about the manufacturing capacity. I saw the announcement. I mean, you already answered it. My second question was, uh, with regards to the supply chain issues of PEM and alkaline, yeah, everyone is aware of the PEM issues, but have you experienced uh, other supply chain issues in alkaline, like uh, especially during COVID times? I have read some like uh, issues about electronics. I think you're like with, with regards to PEM, are you referring to like the PFAS restrictions and like these kinds of things or? Okay, um, that, that's okay. That, that's mainly uh, price changes of iridium and also like especially nickel uh, and steel in the alkaline system, right? Um, so you can also like refer to my colleague David uh, at the booth. He's a sourcing manager um, for the alkaline uh, system. And just on our way from the train to to the fair this morning, he kind of said which. What, what big challenge he has, because if when we are scaling up the factory from like now 500 megawatt to in future 2 gigawatt, that also means that every, every manufacturer needs to follow, right? And I think that's, that's I would highlight that as, a, as kind of our biggest challenge, to take our suppliers along on that way. And these are partly like small companies that like can't, uh, do these big investments. Um, so I think that, that I would highlight that as kind of the biggest challenge going ahead is kind of taking the smaller suppliers by the hand and along in the process of like really aggressively scaling up. Yeah, great. So I'm happy to close our discussion with a question from the audience. Time flies by, but you yeah, already mentioned yeah. the booth. So for everyone in the audience who would like to continue the discussion with Thorsten Herbert and Nell, feel free to visit them at booth yeah. D20. And yeah, enjoy your time. And once again, thank you for being here and for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.